Today, we have Dr. Tali Shah on the show. She's a neuroscientist, author, and professor of cognitive neuroscience at MIT, where her two TED Talks have been viewed over 15 million times. Why do you spend precious moments every day sharing information? The data shows that mental health is deteriorating, especially that's true in younger individuals. And mm. almost in every place, once social media is introduced, mental health goes down. You're constantly focusing on the outside, how much other people would like my post, how, what other people say. But some people would, I guess, argue they look at the media, they look at the news. There's a lot of negative pessimism going around. We kind of like habituate to things that we have in our life that we no longer really realize or notice or feel how great they are. Right. But we don't really notice it anymore because we're used to it. It's constant. So the question that we're asking is, what can we do? What can we do to trigger it again? Welcome to Growth Minds. Whether it's your first time here or you've been here before, I'm curious to know what it is that brought you here. And if you can, smash that like button below. It really helps spread our message to more people. All right, on to the episode. Can you define what an optimist is? Um, yeah, so an optimist is simply someone who has positive expectations of the future. Right, because I think we mostly think about people that are happy all the time or some of them might be always smiling but it's more of like a mental thinking process of their future. That's the, that's kind of the difference. Yeah. Um, and there is a relationship between optimism and happiness because, um, if you're an optimist and you have positive expectations of the future, that tends to make you happy at the moment. Right. Mm. Um, so there is a correlation between the two, but it is not the same thing. Got One it, is kind it. of can cause the other. But I mean, the I, also it is true that um, happiness can cause optimism. So if I'm in a positive mood and I'm happy, that can then trigger more positive expectations of the future. Yeah, and you say here that about 80% of people are optimist. But some people would, I guess, argue they look at the media, they look at the news, and there's a lot of negative pessimism going around the economy, around you know, people doubting that they should even have children because they don't want to bring people into the world of AI robots. So people have this pessimism, it seems, especially with the media and, 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 and the news that are going around. So is there a difference between how, you know, despite 80% of people being optimists, how people can perceive outside of things, outside of their own control as more pessimistic versus maybe their own futures? Yeah, so we call this private optimism, but public despair. So te people tend to be quite optimistic about their own life and their own experiences. Um, and, and even in the private domain, I mean, it's not that you're optimist about every part of your life all the time, right? I mean, it's just on average, people tend to be more optimistic than not. Um, and again, it could be that you're optimistic in your professional life, but not in your like personal, like, you know, romantic relationships or something like that. But on average, people tend to be optimistic about their own um, prospects on average. Mm. And at the same time, on average, they do not tend to be optimistic about public questions, right? Questions about what's going to happen to my country, where is my leaders taking me and so on, uh, climate change. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's definitely this what seems like a contradiction, but can be explained um, in several ways. The first is, as you mentioned, is control. The reason we ha are optimistic about our own life is that we have a sense that we're in control of events that happen in our life, more so than we actually do have control. And right. if we have control, that means we can steer the wheel in the right direction. And so we're optimistic about the potential outcomes. Um, when it comes to public events, we do not have control. Uh, and even if we're overestimating our control, even in public, we, we, most of us realize that, that we don't have much control. And that means that there's no reason for us to imagine that the outcome will be positive. 
Um, that's the first reason why there's a dissociation. The second reason is, um, in fact, to believe that you will be doing well while other people on average will not, in fact, puts you in an even you know, better situation, right? I'm doing well despite right. the fact that the world is going to, you know, uh, Oh, interesting, downhill. okay. So it's almost like a contrast. You think people mm. do that in order to make themselves feel good, knowing that the outside world is not as great as how they perceive themselves inside? Um, again, no, none of it is conscious, right? But I think um, it puts you in a better view, right? You're putting your, you're kind of thinking of yourself as a better, in a, in a better position. Um, you know, it's rather than saying, I will be doing really well and everyone around me will be doing well. Well, that's less good, right? Because people <laughs> um, tend to, uh, I mean, uh, studies are very clear on this. People tend to um, estimate where they are relative to others. And if you ask people, do you prefer to, you know, make 100,000 a year when everyone else is making 150 or make 70 a year when everyone else is making 30 um, and all else being equal in terms of um, how much a dollar is worth in terms of power of purchase, they prefer to gain a little bit less as long as there yeah. are like the big fish, right? Um, yeah, because we're always comparing ourselves to each other. So it really varies based on how the people, particularly the people around us are doing. Uh, I wonder how social media affects our level of optimism when the level of comparison is only skyrocketed. With the tap of a button, you can see people living their vacation life, posting their highlight reels, has there been any research done on the optimism levels of maybe younger generations that have grown up with social media versus people that did not grow up with social media? Mm -hmm. So I don't know about optimism per se, but the data shows that mental health is deteriorating. Um, and it How do you measure that? Oh, how do you measure mental health? Um, well, yeah. there's a lot of questionnaires that's, that looks at psychopathology uh, symptoms. Um, so there's a whole battery of questionnaires that you could give someone. And uh, yeah, you can score their mental health on different dimensions. So you could look at things like depression and anxiety, but also like OCD, like everything. There's a questionnaire and you can give that out. Huh. Um, that would be, and some people do that. You could also do things like... Um, just more simple questions like mood, for example. Right? Just ask people yeah. about their mood. So that's not as good, but it takes less time to to get the data. Um, you is that can how also, they measure? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Is that how they measure like happiest countries in the world? I think like Finland or Sweden, mm -hmm. one of these countries ranks top three countries that are ranked happiest in the world like every single year. Is that similar? data that they get? Because I always wonder like how they measure that. I mean, yeah, they rarely yeah. see so the they, sun. I mean, it's kind of tough to claim that yeah, they're it's, the happiest. It's hard to believe, honestly. It's hard to believe. Um, for that, yeah, they, they usually use a single question. Normally, if I remember correctly, it's something like imagine yourself, imagine life as a ladder, like, you know, the top is like the happiest you could be, the bottom is like the most miserable, like where you are on the ladder, and then you put yourself on the ladder. That's a very common one. So it's something mm. along those lines. Yeah, it's just usually a single question um, that they ask a whole lot of people. They try to do um, a good sample, right? A, a, um, a reflective sample of the population. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you when, when you were, when you were. When you were talking about uh, how do they oh you, you measure how, how do they measure mental health right so yeah. yeah so those are different ways to measure mental health you can also look at things like diagnosis um that is a little bit problematic because um if diagnosis is is greater like more people are diagnosed with mental health problems it could be just that now we tend to diagnose people more right um mm rather than actual people having more mental health. So yeah, so studies definitely show that uh, mental health has been deteriorating, um, especially that's true in younger individuals, teenagers, early 20s. Um, the When it began coincides with when social media began. There's other very, to me, convincing pieces that suggest that there is a tight link between social media and mental health, for example, there are studies where um, people were asked, how much would you uh, 
take, how much money would you take to not use social media for a certain amount of time, a few months? They say how much they, they want, and then they divide the people to two groups. One group, they pay them to go off social media, and the other group, um, I think they still pay them, but they don't go off social media. Anyway, mm-hmm. they try to control it as much as they can. Um, and what they find is those people who go off social media for those few months um, feel better. They do better in every way that you measure it. They're happier. They're interacting more with others in every way they are doing better. Um, so that's a causal manipulation, right? Um, there's also other more correlational, but still convincing evidence. Um, so there are studies looking at, um, okay, so it's interesting about, for example, Facebook, that when it started, it started little by little. So but first it went into like Harvard, second one I think was Columbia I don't remember but it was slowly right each university slowly slowly until finally it appro- it, it actually was um, distributed to universities around the world but you could look at each time point and what's interesting is that universities usually gather mental health scores of their students every few months mm. so you have the mental health scores of these students just before social media was introduced on campus and after. And mm. almost in every place, so, uh, once social media is introduced, mental health goes down, right? Wow. And so, and this happens like slowly throughout, you know, I don't remember how long it was, maybe it was a year, maybe two years, but you can see that. And, and again, that's a bit co- convincing evidence that social media has a direct effect in reducing um, mental health um, in at least young individuals. Yeah. Huh. And I that's think, as you said, one of the reason is that how we assess our life is dependent a lot on how we see ourselves relative to others. And on social media, we are getting too much information about the lives of others, which we don't, we didn't have before that. Like, you know, when I was a university student, I, there was no social media. I did not have to deal with this as a teenager or as a student. Um, I mean, so you don't know and you don't like, it's not something that you think about, right? Definitely. You don't think about daily. You don't compare yourself to others to such an extreme daily. And the problem is the information that you get, of course, is not accurate completely, right? This is curated information. And while maybe, you know, this in the back of your mind, it's still in front of you every single day, right? it makes you feel pretty shitty. Um, And so that is one reason. I think the other reason is this constant focus on the outside, right? Instead of focusing on yourself and your life and what you like to do and, you know, what is interesting for you and getting this kind of reward from the inside, you're constantly focusing on the outside. How much other Mm. people would like my post, how, what other people say, and you can't control other people as much. Um, I think this shift from looking inside to looking outside is another huge reason for the the mental health effect. Yeah, the, I have um, some friends of mine that are like actors or in that world of Hollywood, and they talk about how, <laughs> even in their own profession, how it is really one of the most mentally draining professions that you can have because mm-hmm. often people that are going into it, they wrap their entire identity, their purpose around succeeding as this profession. They take it so seriously. And no matter how great they are, oftentimes they have things that are outside of their control, gatekeepers that will decide whether they get to be in the club or not. And maybe it's a little bit different now, but that's generally the way the industry works. So you're constantly wrapping your entire identity, your profession, your 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 well-being, mm-hmm. your putting a roof on top of your head around external validation. And it's, yeah, it's, it seems like one of the most miserable jobs you can have. (laughs) No offense to actors, but it's, uh, yeah, that's like, seems to be like one of the worst professions Mm -hmm. that you can have around mental health, honestly. Um, What are some of the other things, particularly in the modern age that are harmful to our mental health? Um, beyond social media, I guess potentially the uh, rate of change could cause anxiety. Mm. Um, 
which again is related to technology, right? But some of it is not, right? The pandemic was not necessarily related to technology. I feel like um, there has been, there's been a lot of change and uncertainty in the last decade, more probably than a lot of times in history. Although you can go back in history to some World War uh one World War Two, and then you know the some of the last pandemics and so on. So it's I don't know if it's necessarily something that is true now that hasn't been before, mm. uh, but of course when you're living through it, um, it seems like it's it's pretty unusual. Um, and we'll see with the, with the AI like what transpires. Yeah, it's an interesting insight that you you pointed out because. People often use social media and the comparison of what other people's highlight reels compared to ours is what makes us feel negative and feel makes us feel bad. But when I, I always like studying history and people that I like studying history because they can use comparison in a positive light and you can see negative things that are happening in our society. But when you compare, just like you would with social media to the past of people living in World War II, World War I, uh, you know, back in the plague days, it's a pretty good life that we live in, right? I mean, I think GDP is up by like five times in the last hundred years. It's, it is pretty, uh, like you could also use comparison in that light as well uh, to be more of the optimistic side. I'd be curious to know for optimists, it seems like, I think you mentioned in your TED talk that optimists tend to earn more, they can work longer hours, become better leaders. If the benefits of being optimists are so great what are some of the downsides of being too much of an optimist mm -hmm. so i think the big one is that you're could be underestimating your risks um mm. whether it's financial professional medical right and if you are underestimating your risk again it's not necessarily a bad thing because it means that like i'm going to go for it because i don't really realize you know the risk out there like entrepreneurs mm -hmm. for example right they tend to underestimate the risk as a consequence they go out and try you have to try to succeed obviously um but also as a consequence of underestimating your risk you might not take precautionary action um you know in the medical domain it's quite straightforward um, I think I'm going to be okay, so I continue to smoke. I don't put a helmet on when I go by. I, gotta go, I don't go to medical screening. You know, I eat unhealthily or, or whatever. <coughs> so, um, or COVID, you know, people were underestimating the risk and not taking precautionary action. So it can cause um, harm in that respect. And again, with fi with finance, you see it a lot as well. Right, Peter. Yeah. There could be like severe loss because of, of risk underestimation. So it's kind of like a two edged saw, sword. Um, Marriage you need to as underestimate. Well, right? right. You're underestimating the likelihood of divorce because if you weren't, it would be very hard to actually go out and get married. You have to be like, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going to, you know, we're going to be okay. I'm, uh, for me, it's not 40%. Um, on the other hand, then you don't have a prenup. Well, maybe we'll end up badly. Yeah, yeah. I also heard that men tend to overestimate how the opposite sex perceives them, meaning they think that the opposite sex, whether it's through eye contact or whether it's subtle text messages, they, they think mm -hmm. that they're more attracted, they're more attractive to the opposite sex than they actually mm -hmm. are. And females tend to generally be the opposite. And uh, I don't know if that case, I mean, I guess you could argue that women are attracted to confidence and that could serve them. But yeah, I found that to be an interesting statistic in terms of like what an optimist would be like in a dating world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I mean, you have to be a little bit of that to to act, right? To reach out, to mm. take the first step. Um, yeah. And yeah, you're going to get rejected at times, but um, your likelihood of succeeding is greater the more you try. Mm. So overall, bang for buck that... You would, you would argue that being an optimist in all aspects of life tends to have a more positive result than constantly being the pessimist or the realist. Yes, absolutely. Um, the data is very, very clear on that. Um, but that does not mean that you can't take 
action to protect yourself from the potential negative outcomes, right? So hmm. it's not about changing my optimism. It's about saying, okay, I realize I'm an optimist and, you know, I think I'm going to bike and it's going to be fine. Um, and I still believe that, but I'm going to tr- nudge myself into like wearing a helmet, right? So kind of think through like, because I'm an optimist, what are the potential negative consequences of this? I'm not changing my predictions, but I'm putting in some policy to protect myself, whether it's like you as a person or organization, you know, or maybe a government. Um, And that's kind of, then you, it's like a win-win, right? You have the optimism, you have like the motivation. And at the same time, you fought through um, given the data in front of you, what is potential negative outcomes of this optimism and what you can do um, mm. to n- n- kind of like navigate away from those outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to know like how effective you think this is. So the, like the Stoics, uh, f- the Stoic philosophers, they had this thing that they used to do, which is called negative visualization. It was like a pre meditation of evils where they would mm-hmm. perceive the worst case scenarios. They would basically wake up and become the ultimate pessimist. Like my parents are going to die. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed by one of the enemies by next door. And for them, that was like a way f- to level out expectations so that they can actually appreciate the good things that they have in life by starting their day with such a negative outlook uh, in terms of the visualization aspect. When you when you see that and you see that from like from your perspective as an expert that it has all the data, how effective do you think that would actually be for someone to be more optimistic? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what just what you're describing is a bit like being a parent. You're kind of like, they're going to go <laughs> yeah. on the bike. They're going like, yeah. <laughs> to like fall and get killed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and therefore, like, I'm going to make sure that they wear a helmet, you know. Like, yeah. So basically, when you have kids, you do this all the time. You're always like one step, you know, ahead of like, they're going to fall. They're going right. to whatever it is. Um, now, I wouldn't necessarily... <laughs> recommend it as like a practice for, you know, let's, let's meditate, meditate on like the worst case scenario. And, um, of course that can definitely in, enhance anxiety. Yeah. Um, right. I, on, you know, I can see the benefit of, we do need to think through sometimes like what could happen so we could take action to protect mm. ourselves. That's, that's true. I don't know if we have to do it every single day, to such an extreme. <laughs> it seems very intense, um, right? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the point of um, doing things like that in order to make us realize of the good that we have, and, and you've mentioned two things, right? You mentioned, like, we can compare it to the worst possible scenario that could happen. We can compare mm. it to, like, past events that happened to other people, like, you know, we we're talking about World War II and so on. So that, that, is something that's worth thinking about. And in fact, this relates to um, my new book that's coming up in in the end of February, uh, which is all about how we kind of like habituate to things that we have in our life that we no longer really realize or notice or feel how great they are, right? Mm. Um, Right. Exactly like you were saying, we're like, well, I mean, actually we're living at a great time, um, GDP and so on in, in terms of how things were in the past, but we don't really notice it anymore because we're used to it. It's constant. Right. That's what we like grew up with. So, and it's true on a global level. It's also true on a private level. Those great things in our life, you know, I don't know if that background is real, but it, let's say it is, you know, it's a wonderful house. Looks, It's really pretty. Um, yeah. But like, you know, after you've lived there for a while, um, you don't lo- lo- longer like see it or appreciate it, at least not as much. We habituate, right? And so the mm. question that we're asking is, what can we do? What can we do to kind of trigger it again, right? And I, I think you've mentioned two good things, which is like we could use our imagination. And actually that's something we do talk about. Let's imagine not having the house. Let's imagine not having that spouse. Imagine not having that family. You just do it for a short while. And it's you're suddenly like, oh, you know, I do, it's not like that. Thank God, right? Yeah. Um, and, and appreciate it again. And then physically also, if you were to change your environment for a short amount of time and come back, you usually are able to kind of see again what you missed. Mm. And funny enough, it also works for the negative. So let's take social media, which we actually have a whole chapter on um, as an example. But 
you know, there's a lot of bad things that we do have in our life. And we kind of know that they're not great. But again, we kind of got used to them. It's not that they don't induce negative emotions or stress like social media, right? Or other things. Like we could look at some kind of political things in our country or other things. Um, But we get used to them so we don't see them anymore. We don't feel them anymore. Now you could say, well, that's great. So it doesn't affect you as much. True, but because it doesn't affect you as much, you don't try to change it. Mm. Um, Mm. Because you don't notice it, you don't try to change it. So the same as just like as habituation works on the positive things, which stops you from like really appreciating it. It also works on the negative things. That's great. Especially, you know, if there's like you broke up with someone, you feel really, really bad. And after a while, you don't feel as bad. Great. But it also is true for those things that really we do, we should change. Um, but we don't because we just kind of get used to them and we don't like feel it or see it um, anymore. You know, I think like if you think about if someone just starts with social media and never experienced before all the like, you know, hatred and like the, you know, the the kind of really dreadful things that you, you they would be like, whoa, what is that? But now we kind of look at it and it's like we don't even blink, you know. Mm. You're saying despite it being negative for us, it's kind of in the background, but we don't even know how harmful it is for us. Yeah, it's kind of like background noise. Exactly. It's kind of like there, there's an AC, you know, in the back and you yeah. kind of don't even notice it. You don't know that it's there. But once we shut it down, you're like, whew, mm. that was really irritating. But I didn't really even notice how irritating it was because I didn't I got used to it and I wasn't like noticing it. But once you take it away, it feels much better. And is that, is that have anything to do with, I, I might butcher this, is, is it called hedonic adaptation where no matter how sad or happy we are, we always revert back to our median? Yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, emotional adaptation, hedonic adaptation. Um, and the phenomena is not only about emotion, it's basically related to very basic phenomena by which you get used to everything, whether it's like we mm. said, auditory stuff, or like you uh, jump into like cold water, you feel the cold at the beginning, but your brain kind of adapts to it, right? Or just right. things that are not even bad or good, like a perfume. Well, I guess perfume is good, but let's say it's just a smell. It's not good or bad. You put it on and you it really like you perceive it. But if you're going to use it every day, at some point takes a few weeks, you're not going to perceive it anymore at Mm. all so it's the same mechanism the same mechanism and the reason this mechanism is part of how our brain works is that what your brain needs to do is figure out what's new right this is what i need to like address what's old whether it's a smell or sound or visual thing or uh, temperature or you know bad people talking on social media or um the wonderful house that i live in it's not it's old I don't, I'm, I shouldn't, like, I don't need to pay attention to that because I need to be prepared for like the lion is about to jump on me. Right, right. So would you say then that something like negative visualization, I mean, I think uh, one of the Roman emperors Mm -hmm. who, who like really preached stoicism, Marcus Aurelius, he was like the emperor. He was like one of the most powerful people on earth and he would be sleeping on the floor or he would eat beans for a week. So it wasn't just negative visualization. He really went the extreme and he did negative, uh, I don't know what you would call it, negative practice, I guess you would say negative lifestyle to actually embed himself into this process so that he could appreciate what he has as an emperor, I guess, or his daily life. Um, yeah. so is that one, one avenue you think people should take, whether it's probably through imagination, hopefully no one's just going to sleep on bed of nails or something. (laughs) No, but actually, okay. Yeah, you're exactly right. And we do have an example sort of like that, but not quite as bad. (laughs) Not as extreme. Um, (laughs) Where like, you know, I tell the story that I had COVID, I had to, in order to not infect my family back in the day, I had to go down and and sleep in the basement. So I, I, you know, I had to live in the basement for a few days. Um, And First of all, it wasn't that bad because it was different. So it was a bit like an adventure. Mm. But most importantly, um, it was, when I got back up to ground level, everything seemed so great again, right? Mm. So wow. I wasn't sleeping on a bed of nails, but it's kind of similar, right? If I, I was taking myself out of this context and putting myself in a, in a context that's not as great, when I got back, things seemed better. And in fact, it happens even if you put yourself in a different situation, that's not necessarily worse. 
So hmm. even if you're, you're, let's say, where you're living is quite nice um, and you have, you know, you, you love your family and everything, you just go away for the weekend. You actually, even if the weekend was great, when you come back, you kind of see it again, right? right. And you appreciate right. it again. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be contrasting it with something worse. Mm. Um, and it, actually studies show that this is true also for like uh, kind of less important things in life, like for example, music. So apparently if you hear a song and you really like the song, but you have breaks between the song, turns out that you like the song better. This is counterintuitive because oh, you would feel like you would want to hear the whole song as, as a whole, right? Right. Um, but when you have people rate how enjoy uh, how enjoyable it was if they hear the whole thing as one, or they have breaks in between, they actually enjoy it more when there's breaks in between. Um, oh, and and in fact, more interesting than that, it doesn't matter what they do during the break. So the break could be, just be quiet. The break could be something really annoying, like you know, some a buzzer of like a vacuum cleaner or something, or it could be something nice like another song. Um, mm. But regardless, they enjoy it more. So there's other stuff like that. Um, you can get a massage with breaks or without breaks. Normally, if there's a good event, you actually want to break it up to enjoy mm. it more. Now, and the counter is, is true for negative events. If there's something bad that you have to experience, like you have to go to the dentist, you have to do like your taxes, uh, you have to clean the house, uh, you don't want to break it up. Because if you break it up, right. you're interrupting the habituation process. Um, so you kind of, what we say, swallow the bed whole, but take the, the positive, eat it, chew it up in bits. Interesting. Yeah. So you're saying we should put an ad break in between this podcast so that people can appreciate how good this conversation is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know what I, I do? What um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, so I usually like, it's true. So I, I run anytime there's an ad, I would just go forward. Right. I, I click right. the 10 second forward, 10 second forward. Um, and so I don't hear the ad. But still, it's interesting. This still could actually increase my enjoyment, mm. uh, even if I'm not listening to the ad. The fact that it's like, it's a little bit annoying. I do like that. And like, okay, now like, ah, yeah. we're back to the. <laughs> there was a, exper I don't know if this is from mouse or from even maybe humans, where they did that experiment where they would give rewards, uh, whether it's like a piece of cheese or food, but it wasn't constant. So every two minutes or so they would give mm -hmm. certain rewards but then they would skip certain rewards so they would skip a couple times and then they would give it the reward again and they related that to people that have gambling issues and how they mm -hmm. form these addictive behaviors because sometimes they would get a win and then they would not get a win for 10 days or 10 times and then they would get a win again and that keeps them addictive versus winning on a consistent basis so it's interesting that like rhythm you can't always I mean, it makes me feel good because sometimes maybe, uh, you know, you don't always win, right? You're going to have these down days, but it's a optimistic way to look at that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to shift to decision making a little bit and relate that to optimism where, you know, when we're making these like big decisions uh, and kind of going back to negative visualization. So my mom is facing a lot of issues with her hands with arthritis and I'm trying to convince her to get into stem cell therapy, which in the US is very different than different parts around the world. And obviously, you know, for her not having heard that, it's, it is kind of like a nerve wracking thing because there is a hefty cost. There's no guarantee that it's going to succeed. And instead of looking at the bright side all the time, I, I, we kind of did the opposite effect of like, okay, what's the worst case scenario is like, you tried something, there isn't any solutions in the US or Canada, but uh, worst case, you lose you know, some money, which isn't life-changing money, but it is a significant amount, but that is the worst case scenario. It's very less invasive than surgery. Um, are there things like that, like frameworks that we should use? And do we make better decisions when we're more realistic versus constantly being optimistic? Um, I don't think there's like a straightforward answer to that. As we said, mm -hmm. I mean, it definitely matters what exactly the context is and so on. Um, you know, as we said before, you will take more risk if you're an optimist and if you look at it in an optimistic way. Um, and that means that sometimes 
you will win, right? And and sometimes you will fail. So, um, and and most of the time it's like it's uncertain. So it's it's you don't know what the actual. It's hard to know like what the actual risk. Like, what is the probabilities of each of these right. um, options? Like what they call ambiguity. We don't even know what the risk is um, on most of these things. Hmm. Um, so it's it's a little bit hard to say. It's you know the the way that usually people say how you make decisions is you multiply the gain by the probability of the gain, and you add the loss times the probability of the loss. Um, oh, and I if that is <laughs> if that is a positive number, you should do it, right? So that, that's just like, what, what, is the, what is the utility? What is the value of an action? Um, in your case, the action is, is stem cell um, therapy. So um, what is the gain? The gain is that she will not have this problem. Um, what, and so she needs to think about like, what is the value of that gain, right? I right. guess you can kind of like put it in, in dollars, I guess. Like, you know, mm. if she would have been um, cured how much would that mean to her? Let's say you're like a million dollars, multiply it by what is the probability that that would happen? Maybe it's 20%. So you do mm. zero times two. Now the likelihood of the loss will be like nothing happens. What does it cost? The amount of therapy um, costs, maybe it's $100,000 multiplied by the likelihood that this will happen, 0 0.8. And then you just add these two things up and you see if it, it's a positive number, or if it's a negative number. If it's a positive number, she should go ahead and do it. If it's a negative number, she shouldn't. Of course, it could be something in between. You could be like, oh, and actually it's like, this one is 10% and this one is like 50% because in the middle are all these other options, which is like, well, it helps me, but just a little bit. So I won't feel mm. it in the morning, but I'll feel it in the evening, right? And so what is a what is the value of that? What is the probability of that? And so you can go for all of those things. But of course, everything is like so subjective. Like, how do you put yeah. a number on all of these things? How do you know exactly the probabilities? But, you know, in theory, that's the way that people should be making decisions. I've never heard that before. That's so fascinating. It's like a equation. I've, I've heard different frameworks, like some, some decisions are irreversible. I think Jeff Bezos from Amazon, he has type one decisions, which are reversible and type two are irreversible. If it's irreversible, you take your time. If it's reversible, you just make that decision right away. So it's about speed. Um, but that's fast. Is that how you make decisions with like where to live or like where to do your next book? And like, is that is that like frameworks that you use? No, I don't think I, I use this framework. But I think and, and, and also this is a description of I mean, to some extent, we think that people do do this in again, an unconscious manner, meaning that the brain kind of does this. Hmm. Um, but, and I, and I think I do, I mean, in some cases, let's say in medical conditions, I'm super like risk averse. So if you tell me there's even like a slight risk of, you know, like dying or a slight risk of like having to go for anesthesia, I, I would put this like the value is like, negative like infinity right wow. <laughs> so yeah. um I, I don't know so, so then the likelihood there. that it's it's not a no so, so okay optimism is about probabilities not about value okay so an optimist will think the likelihood of a bad thing happening is low mm. it's not someone who would say i don't care if a bad thing happens right so the value that i put on let's say i don't this is not necessarily true but you say oh, okay at this operation you might lose your hand Okay, so you need to figure out whether it's worth it for you. And there's some benefit. You're doing it for some benefit. So um, what the question is, what is the loss for losing your hand? You have to put a number of it. So you can put like, uh, for me, it's minus 2 million. For you, it's minus a million. That does not mean who, which of us is an optimist. What right. like what determines which are, is like, what is the probability you think you will lose your hand versus what probability if I think I'll lose your hand. Mm. So it's not that optimists... Um, or don't care about losses or care more about gains. It's just like, what do we expect will and will not happen? So it's that probability part of the equation that will change for the optimist, not the value. Hmm. Speaking of losing things, when you're going into, let's say motivating employees or talking to people, I mean, this is me thinking about how I can navigate the conversation with my mom, let's say for doing like a medical procedure like stem cell therapy, when you're talking about, you know, motivating employees as well, or your partners, are there certain times, are there certain times when you should use rewards 
as a persuasion uh, tactic versus punishment? And when do you use each? Or is rewards always better? Or is punishment always better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think how this will work with your mom, but in other situations. <laughs> no, probably not. Like, <laughs> My mom um, listens to this podcast, so <laughs> let's not give away all the tactics here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the theory that, that I present in, in the influential mind, which is the latest book, um, is that, um, rewards tend to be more powerful when what we want to do is get people to act. So if, mm. um, you're trying to get people to act, let's say your kids to tidy up the rooms, your employee to finish the project on time, uh, rewards are usually are, there's a reason for us to think that they are more impactful than punishments um, for two reasons. One is that the way that the brain is kind of evolved and set up is that to get the good things in life, we usually have to act. So I'm first, yeah, I need to move, get the cup and drink, right? Um, so there's an association in our brain between good stuff, rewards and action, hmm. right? To, in contrast, for the bad things in life, uh, negative things, whether it's poison or untrustworthy people or deep waters, we usually not need to not do anything, right? right? Just not act. So if I know there's poison in this cup, I should just like not reach out, right? So it's, so there's an association between not acting and punishment. So that is kind of the natural. And of course, you know, we can overcome it, right? I mean, we could act in order to avoid punishment or not act in order to get reward, but the natural Pairing is reward action, punishment, no action. So what that means is that we tend to think that if you want people to do something, you can offer them a reward. But if you want them not to do something, for example, not to share classified information, what you might want to do is highlight the punishment. Hmm. Right. And it, it has to kind of go together, right? Meaning you, you can't just punish people if you don't want to do something. But when they do something that you want them to do, you can't not reward them because then they won't feel the, the dopamine of the reward. So for example, like if, if an employee is always late and you can prevent them from being late by punishing them in some way, but if they're on time or if they're early, would they continue to be punctual if you don't reward them? So I think being late, I would actually conceptualize that as an action. You want them to be on time, right? It's not that you don't want them to do something. Right. Because being late is not like a non-action. What you want mm. is that person to be there on time. So I would suggest rewards anytime they get there on time. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, when it's, when it's like not acting is like get your kids not eating the cookie. Um, Right. That like what you want is actually like a non-action. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Um, and, and in relation to that, w one of the things that I always wonder about is giving feedback. So to employees or to people that you're, you're, you care about, uh, and this also relates to good news or bad news. Are, are there certain orders? that we should present certain things in order to have it be the most impactful or to have it really register in someone's memory. So if I'm giving them feedback, should you always start with bad feedback and then present the good stuff? Or should you praise them and then be like, but here are some things that you should work on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, for me, it's not so much about the order, but it's about the framing. So what you want to do is when you give feedback, even if it is about something that someone did wrong, um, mm. it's all about what do you have to do to get it right, right? So instead of saying, um, you know, you really like this essay, it really doesn't work, or, or like, you know, this client is really unhappy, it's more about, okay, here is what you can do with this essay to make it better right so there's this problem which is it's too long and then you want to make it too concise uh, more concise right right so what do we need to do to get to the goal rather mm. than focusing even on what you'd want to avoid to not do the bad you know to not get to the bad outcome so um it's not about to me so much um 
and definitely praise the good stuff as well. But when it comes to like the the negatives, it's more about just making sure that you frame it in a way that you're highlighting what someone needs to do in the future to get to the goal, rather than just focusing on the negative elements and how that negative action led to like these, this bad outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think you talk about like the IKEA effect around this as well, where there's just certain ideas or actions when you give people ownership of that, they're more likely to follow through with it. it, it could the same be said, well, can you actually explain that actually first? And can you explain how that could relate to persuasion and helping people to take actions on things that you want them to do? Yeah, so people are more motivated when they choose the course of action themselves. So let's say you have an employee, they have like two projects that they could work on. Um, if you tell them what to do, they will be less motivated than if they choose it themselves, even if they choose the same thing that you are about to give them anyway, right? So mm -hmm. when someone makes a choice, they tend to um, appreciate it more, partially because they quickly reevaluate the options after they made a choice to convince themselves that they, they did the correct choice, right? So if you're like, should I go to London for this project or should I like go to New York for this other project? And they're both good and they're great. You don't know what to choose. And you say, okay, fine, I'm going to choose New York. What people do, they rationalize, oh, why New York is good? And they say, okay, London is gray and rainy. I won't, I'm not going to be happy there. The project in New York is like more exciting. So now they appreciate it more because they went through this rationalization approach, which they don't usually do if someone else makes a choice for them because they don't need to rationalize right. a choice because it was someone else's choice altogether. Um, uh, so yeah, so people, and that's true for whether it is choosing something, but it's also true for whether you make something. So if you made something, you made it yourself, you tend to appreciate it more versus the exact same thing that someone gave to you. Um, mm. That actually we tend to think is because um, you, if you do something yourself, you actually have a, you've learned something, you have a blueprint. So it actually makes sense right? As you say, the IKEA effect, like the IKEA effect is like you buy something at IKEA, you make it yourself, you value it more than if like you just got the same thing made. Even if it's um, worse quality, right? Even if you just completely turns messed out up that, yeah, and you're not yeah. handy like me. And there's many reasons for this is like, well, you put in the effort. So now it's worth more because it's not only like the pieces of wood, but it's like your time, your effort. Mm -hmm it's also more related to you, right? So you like people, you know, things that are related to the self are valued more. So now mm. this Ikea thing, it has memories, right? It's related yeah. to me. Um, but yeah. also I've learned something from it, right? For sure. So now mm. there's a value, not only in the object, but also in the experience. Mm. Yeah, this this reminds me of, uh, cause obviously I, I, I was born in Korea and I grew up there for a while. And I came to Canada and people talk about how there's such a unique business model to Korean barbecue. I don't know if you have Korean barbecue, if there's a lot of Korean food in Boston there. Um, I'm sure there is, but I don't think I've went to, to oh, Korean barbecue. I highly yet. recommend, I highly recommend. Well, it's the unique thing about it is that all they're doing is they're giving you marinated meat and you put fire in front of right. you. It's just a grill yeah, yeah. and you're generally with 10 people and you're basically, cooking your own food mm -hmm. and then tipping to per cook your own food basically it's like a genius ikea kind of business model similar to yeah. like frozen yogurt people never complain yeah. about how much it is because they're the ones that took that ownership of choosing how much frozen yogurt they want right. uh so i think things like that are fascinating particularly like in the world of business uh, final question for you around how we can apply this to negotiation when you're talking about uh, giving people ownership or maybe even different things around influence or persuasion. If you want to be, if someone is negotiating their salary or they're negotiating anything in life, what are some of the tips that you would recommend that have proven to be useful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the idea is that you need to think whether you could get the other person to come up with a solution that you want, right? Um, right, right. If, if that's possible to have them think that they came up with it rather than telling them why something is good. And actually, I made this exact mistake today. Today? <laughs> where, yeah. <laughs> where um, we had to choose a cover for the upcoming book, and I really preferred one over the other. 
Yeah. And instead of, um, and there are different stakeholders in this decision. Um, and I just gave like, I like this because like A, B, C, D, E, and I don't like that one because A, B, C, D, E, and that just went in the wrong direction. So what happened was the other person was like, hmm, I now I'm going to like, she doesn't like this other option. I'm going to think about contradicting reasons why actually it's a good option, right? Because it's one of the options. I think at the beginning, they may have not had a preference, but mm. now they're like, wait, no, I, I don't disagree with that. So that was yeah. like not a good approach <laughs> at all. Okay, I should have thought about that a little bit more carefully. Um, let's play this yeah. out because obviously, the I hope it's not a final decision. So if you were to email them back or get on a call with them and you now have the second chance to convince them to pick the book art that you want, how would you approach that? I would maybe ask questions that would lead to the benefit for the other book. You know, I mm. would be like, okay, so which one do you think, like what the advantage I think, which one do you think is like more original? Uh, which one do you think, wh which one do you, is this, you know, like ask the mm. questions where they can come up with the answers, but I'm asking specific questions, right? Right, but that would most um, likely lead them to say yes. Like if the book, other one is green, you could be like, what's what's like more organic looking cover yeah, photo? Yeah, yeah, I wonder what do you think, what, what's more organic or, yeah. So I right. think asking questions, you know what the answer is, uh, mm. maybe a good way to go rather than saying, I think this one is like, not unique. I think that one's not boring. I think that one is like more, you know, uh, be like, yeah, I think, I think that's one way to do it. Yeah. It's easier to do in person. I think email may be a bit trickier. Why is it easier? Uh, in but person? you could what potentially, you... well, it's just more like back and forth, back and forth. Right. 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 Email is, I mean, you can't just have one question. <laughs> I don't know. I yeah. guess you can come up with like a bunch of questions. I want, you know, and also, so I think if you have a conversation, people will or, will organically answer that question without like thinking about it a lot before um, and thinking about, well, I'm answering the question, but maybe I'm saying something else. You know, when it, when it's an email, you you kind of think about it more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there also differences in the body language when you would be doing it in person? Like maybe you're not as desperate. <laughs> you're like, what about this one? Maybe you're kind of careless, right? You're a little bit indifferent. Is there other things that you would do in a nonverbal manner that would persuade them to pick that one that you're thinking about? Um, hmm. I'm not sure that I can think of something. Or it's more just that you think they would just respond more intuitively. Yeah, what you than... want to do is like just cause the other person to come up with the reasons that you've already thought, right? Mm, right? Right. So it doesn't come from you, it comes organically from them. Right. Because if you're already giving them the solution, um, if they are unsure or if they have another opinion or if, you know, they gave you two options, meaning they thought these two are good. And now you're like telling them, I don't like that one. They mm. then try to like defend that one, which then causes them to think that that's actually the better option. Right. Right. Um, well, I hope they don't listen to this episode. No, I mean, conversation. <laughs> just for your oh, wait, sake. I, I don't think we're having another conversation. <laughs> no. okay. um, you think that was it? You're not going to try again? I, well, I mean, I, I don't think we're having a, a, an in-person conversation. Um, About that, but, right. Yeah. Um, anyway, right. but I think well, the podcast will be much after the decision has been made. So. <laughs> All right. Well, can you talk about the book, what's coming up? I don't know when it's coming. You said February, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the end of February. I think it's February 24, I want to say. Uh, it's co-written with Cass Seinstein. 
um, yes. who uh, is one of the co-authors of Nudge and Noise. Um, and it's called Look Again, The Power of Noticing What Was Always There. And I think we talked about it a little bit before. It's all about like how we get used to things that are just there in front of us, whether it's really, really good or really, really bad, and we don't mm. notice it anymore. So it doesn't bring us as much joy, uh, but also it doesn't bring us as much pain, which is a good thing, but it also means that we don't try to change it, whether it's in our personal life, but also whether it's global things like climate change or um, you know things like going on in social media, um, discrimination, um, but also kind of looking more at creativity and innovation. It's sometimes so hard to see what, what, what is there that needs to be different, you know, cause mm. it's just there all the time. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't even like trigger. And so there, are, um, some interesting studies on how you can change that, how you can see things that you haven't seen before. I mean, I mean, literally, but also kind of how you can think about them when you didn't think about things like that before. Yeah. Um, so things, it could be some, again, some of the things that we've talked about imagining different scenarios, but also just changing your context. Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about going to the basement, but, um, but also things like turns out just changing like your physical environment and just like changing how your body and changing things like that actually can then, um, also change your mental state and the kind of things that you, that you notice. Mm. Um, yeah. Like the body mind connection. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then choices, you know, we talked about things like how you want to break the good things into bits, right? But not, not the bad things. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's kind of going back to your original books, like The Optimism Bias and The Science of Optimism. And it's kind of commingling with your more recent book, The, the, the Influential Mind, which all three I, should, I highly recommend that people check out. We'll have that link below. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for this one to come out. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll promote it as well when it comes out. Is, it, is there going to be a pre-order session as well before that? Yes, um, okay. it is not on yet, but maybe, I don't know. I think once the cover is decided, it might be already on okay. Amazon. <laughs> well, it seems it's already decided, so, so hopefully we'll soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, should, you should just go ahead and see what you think if it's, if it's a more interesting or less interesting one. All right. Well, I'll give you my what honest opinion when, when I see it. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it, Holly. I, uh, I want people to obviously check out the books that you've written. Uh, where else can people find you online, social media, anything else you want to point them to? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the talks are online. So if you just Google my name, you could see um, the two TED Talks, but other talks yep. as well. And then um, my lab, which is called the Effective Brain Lab. So affective with a as in affect emotion. Um, so we have a website, the affective brain lab, and it, it has a lot of academic papers and things like that. So if people are interested in that, but also it has a lot of the um, talks and like news media pieces, as well as just like popular essays and in, in like popular press um, mm. about the work. So should be there something for everyone, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. The mm -hmm. TED Talks I think viewed like more than 50 million times. I gotta be honest, I was a little bit like intimidated talking because your Wikipedia is just one of the top female scientists in our country. It lists as one of the top 15 female Israeli born scientists alive. And it's always like, you know, interesting for me to have these conversations because I'm, I feel like almost like a monkey talking to smart people like yourself. So I'm yeah. glad you were able to bring it down to earth for people like myself and uh, hopefully people. Oh, no, no, no. This was definitely a. Equal conversation for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, well, and good luck to your mom. Yes. Yes. With thank you so much. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't listen though to this one. <laughs> okay. Tally, thanks so much okay. for coming on the show. Uh, and hopefully we can have you back on when the actual uh, book is out and we can judge the book Sounds cover good. for ourselves. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye -bye. Thank you.